Revelation chapter 13 And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, and that no man might buy or sell, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. Hi guys, it's me. Remy's back again, and I've got some really good information for you. Um, I, have, I have two other videos under the name of Why the Bible is Mark and the Beast 1 and 2. This is going to be the third and hopefully the last video, because about this time I'm, I'm pretty disgusted with uh, all the things that I've been finding out. I just had no earthly idea on how bad this thing is, but it's really bad but I'm gonna I'm just gonna continue and, and and we'll see what happens as we go along um, I'm gonna start this thing out with a history of King James the sixth of uh, short history who was born in the sixth month in the year 1566 and of course that equals 666 in numerological terms uh, he reigned as King of Scotland since he was 13 months old and he was crowned the King of England on July 25th 1603. King James then, uh, he took the throne in what he styled as Great Britain in 1604, which then included England, some of what is France, Scotland, and Ireland. During this time, there was much back and forth between Catholicism and Protestantism, and during the time, um, and during the time of the Reformation, Protestant Protestantism was granted certain rights whereby Northern Ireland was given to uh, Protestant settlers. And I, I, I'm saying Protestant and Presbyterian, um, but this has to, a lot to do with both of those religions. Well, anyway, once the land was given to Northern Ireland, 
um, to the Protestants and spurred on also the translation of the King James Bible of 1611 along with the dissolution of, dissolution of the first parliament for King James. Um, ever since King Henry VIII, there was much violence in those days over what the true religion of Great Britain was, whether it was Catholic or Anglican, and some called the Church of England, and wars ensued, which I'm sure you guys know about, and included the English Civil War and the American Revolution, whereby uh, new naval laws were ins instituted, which became known as Admiralty Law, and I'll get to that in a minute. But as it turns out, uh, the Anglican Church and Catholicism are extremely similar relatives, it seems. And I'm trying to keep this short, so I don't want to go on that. And if you guys want to um, study it, you know, go ahead, because it's very interesting. However, um, even though the Angl Anglican Church and Catholic Church are so much alike, King James' sentiments were in, the, in this like, he said, kings are justly called gods for their exercise, in, for the, sorry, kings are justly called gods for the, for they exercise a manner or resemblance of divine power on earth. And this is how he ruled. And I, I always wondered what that meant. So everything came together this week for me. And I realized that King James was citing, no doubt, the Magna Carta documents of 1215. Um, and that is an eye-opener if you really read it. Because um, it establishes the government, the government by covenant. Authority of the Charter is based on honoring, quote, God. That's the first rule. The second is mutuality is indicated by the assent of both kings and barons. Number three, the community of our relationship is based on, quote, our kingdom, end quote. Four, irrevocability is shown by the extensive use of the word, quote, forever. End quote. Are you guys listening to this? Five. The purposes of the Charter have never been modified. Ever. Ever. Six. The Charter is binding on future generations since 1200. Indicated by the term, huh, quote, for us and our heirs. Seven. And it serves as the framework for English laws today, for all English laws today, of which America is an integral part. Are you sick yet? Because I truly am. I didn't know how deep this went. I just started to do a little study and this goes really deep. Again, the Magna Carta was confirmed by a document named Confirmati Cotarum on November 5th in 1297, and it applied to the church as well as everything else. Now, and, um, on December 16th, 1689, the Bill of Rights acknowledged Christianity as, as part of England's legal heritage and claimed the Protestant religion is a main part of its national identity. You see, guys, what's going on here is that they're going around since before 1200 and claiming everything that could poss they could possibly claim as their own under the guise of kingship. And I, I'm just really... I'll be the first to tell you, I, I am amazed. Now, here, this is why I just, I'm going to stop here after I, after I just tell you this a little bit, and then you can go ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the uh, documents that you can go look at after this. But what happened in America under King James 
is, uh, was in 1606. It was called the First Charter of Virginia, April 10th, 1606, and it established that the English king ruled by the grace of God and that it is proper for a civil ruler to be a minister of God, God, and do his will, and that colonization was for the purposes of converting the natives to Christianity and the establishment of a settled and quiet government. The colonists were taught to view the undertaking by Christ's Great Commission. They would call it Christ's Great Commission, in other words. So, I always knew that colonization was wrong, and I always knew that they used religion, but this is why. And I, I had no idea. I, I, I really didn't. I, I didn't know it was this deep. But it's very, very deep. Um, so I, I'll put the, uh, the link to a couple of documents that you could read for yourself about our country, how it's tied by the King James Bible to everything that we do and live by in the United States of America and actually all over the world. Um, now, I'm saying the King James Bible because that's the Bible that all of this took place under. But of course, there were several Bibles before the authorized King James Version, such as the Wycliffe, the Tyndale, and the Geneva. But eventually, man would decide that it did not conform to the ecclesiology of the people, and it was changed. The Geneva Bible fell out of vogue because it did not conform well enough to the Church of England's beliefs about clergy before the King James Version entered the scene. All these Bibles had to conform to people, whether they be kings or regular class people, but they did not conform to God, and that's quite evident. It seems that God is what man wants him to be in the minds of these men. And the people follow whatever these king gods desire. Now even in the printing of the King James Version, that was fraught with violence as, as well. And all of this stuff, I found it, you can find it too. Now although the system called... Uh, constitutional monarchy developed along with par the parliamentary system of law. It wasn't in King James' reign, but suffice, suffice it to say, a constitutional monarchy is where the monarchy acts as the head of state, with a constitution overseen by parliament. But see, all these changes happen after all these laws took place, and how they hooked or hoodwinked the world into doing into all their bidding but uh, however during the time of King James power was definitely executive and not just ceremonial as it is today in the UK King James ruled the lands and made the laws created the tax systems and was the first commander in war except he never fought a day in his life I'll be back Okay, guys, um, I wanted to talk to you about um, the Book of Common Prayer and how I found out that um, the great similarities between Catholicism and uh, the English Church, Church of England, um, but I'm going to move on because um, that's easy to find out and you'll find, and you'll know from what you don't know net from what you know now you'll understand that that crown copyright and the Book of Common Prayer are all tied in together with the laws of the land and actually the whole world as far as how the money is distributed from our taxes. So now you've seen for yourself about the Book of Common Prayer and you've seen for yourself how our government system is set up on the King James, uh, James Version Bible and now I'm going to show you how people protect at all costs the King James Version Bible 
for no good reason, but they do it anyway. This is proof. Um, hold on one second. This is a King James Moment, brought to you by Lighthouse Baptist Church in Grand Prairie, Texas. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the King James Bible is not copyrighted. Now in the store you may find a, a copy of a King James Bible and pick it up and you'll see a copyright in there, but I can assure you that's not uh, in reference to the scripture. That's the publisher's copyrights for the things that they've added, marginal notes, study helps, maps, and all the stuff in the back. But the scripture text itself in the King James Bible is not copyrighted and there's a reason. It's God's Word. On the other hand, these New Age Bible versions, so-called, they are copyrighted. I want to read a copyright disclaimer from a couple of these. They're all almost the same. Uh, most of them, uh, here I have, what is this, the New Revised Standard Version. It says, the NRSV text may be quoted and or reprinted up to and inclusive of 500 verses without express written permission of the publisher, provided the uh, verses quoted do not amount to a complete book of the Bible, nor account for 50% of the written text of the total work of which they're quoted. And it, then it says, so in other words, if I want to get up and read uh, out of the Bible publicly, I would certainly not be, in, not, would, not only would I not be inclined, but legally would not be able to do that without uh, getting written authority ahead of time if I was going to quote more, read or quote more than 500 verses. Uh, that's the New Revised Standard Version. That is uh, almost identical here in um, the NIV it's also there at 25% uh, of the total work uh, cannot be, and it's 500 verses. Uh, the NAS and the NASB, it's also 500 verses and 25% of the total body of work. Now, I'm not inclined to use those, but were I, uh, we would be very limited in, in our ability to use that. In other words, you cannot read or quote publicly or uh, write down or use more than 500 verses, and, uh, and it cannot... Uh, constitute an entire book of the Bible. So you cannot write down the, the book of Jude, for example, or I couldn't just go out in public and read the book of Jude. That would be uh, against this copyright. So I want you to think about that. Um, that tells me quite obviously that these are not the Word of God. They are copyrighted and God's Word is free. Now nobody has the right to prevent anybody from quoting or copying God's Word. Uh, in fact, over in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse number 9, we're told that uh, the Word of God is not bound. So the Apostle Paul knew something. Well, I guess these guys do know something. They know it's not God's Word. The, the words in these new versions are bound. God's Word is not bound. Now, somebody may be really smart and say, well, what about the American Standard Version? It's not copyrighted uh, because it's so old that the copyright is dropped off. And listen, I'm not saying that the fact that the King James Bible is not copyrighted proves that it's the Word of God, but I'm telling you, uh, it, it makes it one of the candidates. And any new version, uh, any of these here that, that have copyrights on their scripture uh, can't even be considered as a possibility for being the Word of God. And a King James Bible detractor or attempted corrector may come on and say, well, uh, the King James is copyrighted. There's the British Crown copyright. See, but the Crown copyright was not to prevent people from using, copying, or reading, or uh, uh, using the, uh, the Word of God. It was actually to protect the Word of God itself. See, it disallowed the text from being changed. So it, it was the stamp of approval on there and it was not allowed to be changed. In fact, uh, I wish that uh, that was enforced today because there are a few publishers that try to make a few subtle changes. Even their Bible haters, they print all these and so they, they try to print, they print also some King James scripture but then they change a couple of words here or there and they can't even be trusted. And, and that British uh, Crown copyright was specifically to prevent those kinds of things. But here here is a photocopy of the King James Bible. It's a photocopy of the 1611 and if you look from Genesis 1-1 uh, into the scriptures and come back all the way through all of the charts, all of the information, all the opening letters, uh, everything that you find here, one thing that you will find missing is a copyright, my friend. See, there's no disclaimer in here that says you need anyone's permission to copy it or quote it. You're not limited to 500 verses. Listen, I just believe the king would have been excited, as God would be excited, if we would just get up and read and quote and copy and distribute all of his word all the time as much as possible. 
See, the British Crown copyright is solely to protect the integrity of the Scripture. In 1631, there was an edition of the King James Bible printed that had a typo in the Ten Commandments. The word not was accidentally left out. So thou shalt not commit adultery uh, turned out, and, and as it was printed, it said thou shalt commit adultery. Now some of the new version proponents will make that an aha moment and kind of make fun of it as if it somehow disproves the preservation of God's Word. But the result, the, there's only a few of those that exist today. You want to know why? Because the printers who printed that edition were heavily fined and all 1,000 copies of it were ordered to be burned. Remember that crown copyright was solely to protect the integrity of the text. While the modern day copyrights uh, over here are, are more designed to protect the bottom line of the publisher's profits. See, if their version could be copied by anyone, then somebody might be able to print it for cheaper and they'd have to lower their prices. Obviously, I don't think that King James's motive for uh, commissioning the translation of the King James Bible had anything to do with profit. See, he was the king. He was already rich. He didn't need money. He knew that people needed God's word. And, and that's, what was, that's what was required. And see, we needed to be able to use it and distribute it without any arbitrary restrictions. God owns the King James Bible. And he didn't give it to us with any kind of disclaimer attached. And once again, this has been a King James moment from Lighthouse Baptist Church. Now that we're finished with our King James moment, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk to you guys about an image. Now, um, being that I used to be in my other life a court reporter, I know the... Um, importance of how words are laid out on a page um, and this is you know I tell you all your experience that you have in, in your life is for a specific purpose a higher purpose and um, I'm going to um, try to prove to you again why um, I had to <laughs> leave my profession um, because I saw the dirt involved in it and I'm sorry that's exactly what it was the legal system is shot to hell it's all based on lies and it's based on the King James Version Bible as well well you know in 127 when it tells you that you know God created man in his own image well look at this what is an image Number one, it's a reproduction or an imitation of the form of a person or a thing, especially an imitation in a solid form. Two, the optical counterpart of an object produced by an optical device as a lens or mirror or an electronic device. A visual representation of something as a likeness of an object produced on a photographic material, a picture produced on an electronic display like a television or a computer screen. It could be an exact likeness, likeness, a semblance. Exact likeness and semblance. That doesn't go, but anyway, they give this example. God created man in his own image in Genesis 127. Of course, they use the Revised Standard Version. You can go look up the King James Version. It's the same. A person strikingly like another person. She is the image of her mother. Well, you know what? Like is not the same thing as, okay? That's number one. Keep that in mind. Number four, a tangible or visible representation. Incarnation. The image of a filial devotion. Well, it goes on and on, guys, but um, I wanted to give you an idea of what the Bible says as far as we, man, was created in his own image. Or is the Bible talking about the elite were, were created in their God's own image? I'm not sure, but one thing we know is that an image is not the real thing at all. You know, I could think of a whole lot of images in my head that are not real. Like, let's look at this Hubble and Spitzer telescope images that 
they call false color processes where they give you an image of something in space it's only heat and cold and they make an image and they lay it on top of one and another and they come out and they and they color it with with the process known as false color and this is what you get isn't it gorgeous but it's not real and um, there's an there's lots more images that I can think of like here's a here's one uh, another one from uh, a telescope that you would really think that space looks like that but guess what nobody really knows what space looks like because nobody's been there which is it's just gas and light and dark shadows and heat and cold and they layer on top of one another and people actually think that this is real. They actually think it looks like this. And incidentally, this image is what it looked like 1500 years ago because that's how long it takes to travel at the speed of light to, to this wonderful make-believe place that they tell you is an image. Well, how about when you say you love someone? And um, you give them a little representation of what that love is. And look what you get. Wow, that's really love, isn't it? That's so representational of, oh, it, it just feels so good, doesn't it? What about when they break your heart and, and, you're, and you're in pain? Everybody's been through that kind of stuff, huh? Sometimes I'm still going through it. Look at that. Oh, my heart is broken. These are all images, folks. This is what they tell you that is real but it's not. How about this one, guys? How about dating somebody like, like this? That's the image of a woman, isn't it? Is it a real woman? Sure, it's pretty, though, but it's not a real woman, is it? Well, it might be a woman, but it's certainly not a female. And, um, <laughs> the next one is the mirror image of God. Who's Adam and who's God? I don't know. And look at God. Look at how he looks. Wow. He's flying up in the sky, but he's the spirit. Look at that face. Look at him. Oh my God. Michelangelo really knew. What about Morgan Freeman? He makes a good God. You know? And they ask you to keep the cross on your mind. The Bible does say, don't worship graven images, doesn't it? Yet, all these images I'm showing you are representations of God and men as God, and um, it's just sickening. I can go on and on, and I will. I want to show you about mine and your money and your money on your mind, like Snoop says. Well, King James had his mind on his money and his money on his mind. Listen, uh, this is the definition of what King James decided to do, a revenue stamp. It's a small piece of adhesive paper that is put on an object to show that a government has tax has been paid. In other words, it's an image under the control of the mark, which is the Bible, that the beast gave us, which he made to speak. Did you hear me? It's an image under the control of the mark, which is the Bible, that the beast gave us, who he made to speak, which is the Bible. I'm getting a little bit tired of talking, but here is your law and all the history that goes with it. You can stop it and read it whenever you want. And here are all your images of the beast.
You see, there are two kinds of law. This is a subject I, I love. I've been talking, talking about this for years. There are two kinds of law on the earth that rule the whole world. But most people don't know that. All over the world, all governments are ruled by what is called civil law. Civil law goes back to a Latin word, civili, which goes back to the word illi. Oh God, I mean, you go on for hours on this stuff. Civil law, which is called in all countries the law of the land. So you'll say, well, you can't do that because that's against the law of the land. The law of the land is civil law, Roman civil law, the law of the land. But there is a second law which also operates all over the earth identical. It's called UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. That is the law of God in the world of business. I don't care if you're in Japan, in Africa, in China, in, in Istanbul, Turkey. If you have a company, if you have a corporation, if you are doing business where you buy and sell and make money, you are operating on this earth under something called UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. Because if all countries worked on a different commercial code, then nobody could do business with anybody. You couldn't trust Japan to pay you. you Japan couldn't trust America to pay them for the cars. Because everybody has their own laws. Uh-uh. Under the Caesars of Rome, they established under Caesar that all nations in the empire that do business, everybody plays on a, on a level field. If you do business in Africa with China, you pay them. And if Africa does uh, uh, business with American companies, you pay them. You pay whatever it is you're doing business, you don't mess around. The most severe law in this world is called UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. It's the Bible of business on the earth. Uniform Commercial Code. Uniform Commercial Code is based directly on Vatican Canon Law, on the Roman Canon Law. Consequently, when a ship pulls into port, it pulls in and stops in its call in its berth. The ship is now in its berth. Because it is on the law of the high seas, or commercial maritime, UCC commercial law, rules the seas. So when the ship pulls into its berth, the first thing the captain must do is to present a certificate of manifest to the port authorities, which means that the port authorities need to know how much is on this ship that you're bringing into our country and our economy. How many TVs, how many cars, uh, whatever you're bringing, how much are you bringing into our economy. So you have to have a certificate of manifest of what is the value of your ship here, what are you doing. Consequently, when you are born, you come out of your mother's water. Therefore, you must have a birth certificate, a certificate of manifest, because you are a corporation-owned item. You are a human resource. This goes back to the German Nazi concept that every human coming out of their mother's water must be birthed. And therefore, you have to have a certificate, a manifest, to see how much this individual is going to make for us in our new world order. I'm telling you that until you understand the laws, the symbols, the emblems, what these words mean, you're never going to suspect how far gone we really are. Did you know, for instance, that your birth certificate is a security on the stock exchange in the New York stock market. Did you know that? Because if you order your birth certificate, get a new one, order your birth certificate, it'll only cost you, sometimes it's free, it'll only, only cost you a few dollars, order your birth certificate. On your birth certificate, all birth certificates in this country, on the bottom, it will tell you, this is printed on security papers. Do not accept, if not on full color security paper, then on the right hand corner you will always have a series of numbers, red numbers, printed on the, on the birth certificate. 
those numbers are a security stock exchange number on the world stock exchange. You go to any good stock or office and ask them, check these numbers in your computer and see how much your stock is worth, the certificate. And they will check it on the New York Stock Exchange and find you, your birth certificate, is a stock on the stock exchange in America. Why? Because you are worth money to the international bank that bought you in 1930. We need to wake up.